Well, it is time to talk more about the economy and the outlook for inflation, among other things. Our Kathleen Hayes joins us now with the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Kathleen. Carol, thank you so much. And of course, Richard Fisher has been the president of the Dallas Fed since 2005. And he's been saying recently the bigger risk in the economy is deflation, not inflation. He's here to explain that and what he sees for the economy more broadly. Richard, welcome. Great to have you in studio. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, uh, for, so for starters, let, let's just pick up on this because right. you have been saying in so many speeches, you still think deflation is the greatest risk. But every time I see that, I go, but, but Richard, you know, I'm talking to the TV screen. You know, <laughs> the bond market is sold up. Big move up in Treasury yields. Right, right. There's this concern over the Fed's balance sheet. And oil, it's, it's sold off a bit today, but it's Two still bucks, over yeah. $70 a barrel. I mean, right. are you starting to shift your view? No. Look, the objective is price stability. And, and deflation is as bad a menace or as evil a spirit as inflation is. I, you know that I'm, if not the most extreme hawk on inflation, I'm certainly extremely wary. All my colleagues are. I'm not alone. But the price pressures, it, it, short term, there's so much slack in the system. And uh, of course, long term, we all know that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. On a sustained basis, if you expand the money supply too much, you're going to have inflationary pressures. That's not the issue right now. And if you actually look through the number, look through the entrails, you, you have to take out tobacco, by the way, which has been a, a significant influence just in terms of the little mm -hmm. mini numbers and components that go into there. But there's too much slack in the system right now. And I don't see inflationary pressures rearing their ugly heads, particularly if we conduct ourselves properly, which I believe we are doing. Well, well, you know, and I want to remind people who, who don't follow the Fed quite as closely as I do that you really established those anti-inflation, you know, credentials if you, if you hadn't already in, in 2008 when you dissented against rate cuts because right. you were concerned about the Fed moving too quickly. So let's explain why you say, you know, you have bu built up your street cred as a right, central right. banker. But, uh, you know, what do you make of the fact then that Fed funds futures traders? Now, you were also a hedge fund manager. You were a money manager. You know how the markets work. But there, the, after the uh, last employment report, there were 70 percent odds of a move by the November meeting. What do you make of that? Right. I, I, a move higher, I should say, because you can't go lower. I, I understand now. And, I, and I know what the numbers are, but I, again, I don't pay a lot of attention. Personally, I don't pay a lot of attention to that. You have to remember, these are emotional swings. They are concerns at the margin. Personally, the idea of our tightening from where we are, I don't see it in the immediate future. Uh, I realize there are pressures on some commodities. You mentioned oil in specific. There are some pressures on commodities and so on. You have to remember they're coming off the Baltic index, but they're coming off enormous lows, phenomenal lows after significant corrections. So, yes, things are tightening up a little bit, but relative to what? Relative to a period of extreme slack. Having said that, I'm very, you know, I would love to be a screeching hawk once again, but I just don't think it's appropriate presently. Okay, well, as for the... Uh as for the the balance sheet, though, and the right. concern about inflation that stems from there, right. the output gap is a very Keynesian argument, mm -hmm. but we, we can't measure it precisely. Even Congress mm -hmm. is questioning Ben Bernanke on that. Mm -hmm. And it's the monetarist who are saying the balance sheet is there, and if you right. can't exit quickly and you don't exit in a timely manner, that's what's going to cause the inflation The, the operative words to what you just said, Kathleen, are timely manner. And, and we're constantly talking about, and we are constantly, as we speak, working on developing this exit strategy. I won't go into any of those details, but the fact is we're mindful of it. We're also mindful of the fact that long term, as I said earlier, a sustainable inflation derives itself from monetary policy. And uh, short term, it is a function more of slack and uh, capacity constraints and so on. So, you know, I'm not convinced, even though I watch for this very carefully, that the backup in rates has to do with a fear we're going to monetize the deficits. As you know, I've spoken out about that. The chairman has spoken about out, out about that in uh, congressional testimony. I think this is largely a matter of supply and demand. The Treasury is borrowing an enormous amount of money. And the economy is doing better and less worse than it was before. I'm okay. not surprised to see rates back up. Okay, Richard. Well, I'm glad you agreed to spend the half hour with me because <laughs> better... Less worse. This is a, a, a very key theme right now in the financial markets and a very important issue for the Fed as it gauges its exit strategy, how it's going to maintain price stability as we go from one of the worst recessions since the Great Depression to something like recovery. More with Richard Fisher when we return. We're back now with Richard Fisher, president of the Dallas Fed. And, and Richard, we were, you were saying that you think the backup in bond yields is mainly because of supply. But what about this concern about the Fed's long-term inflation fighting credibility 
when it's going to be so tested. The Fed hasn't been tested like this for a long, long time. Getting out of the balance sheet, uh, Alan Meltzer uh, from Carnegie Mellon right. I interviewed recently, he said with the political pressures, mm -mm, Fed's going to buckle. They won't be up to the task. Well, first of all, I hold Alan in the highest regard. He's a man of enormous integrity. And I think it's good that he's pressing us on this argument. I think he's wrong uh, out of respect. We will do what's right. I, 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 it's been very clear. Again, Ben Bernanke made clear in his testimony we will not monetize these deficits. And as you know, there are several bank presidents who feel extremely strongly on this issue. I'm one of them. But I don't think I'm that much of an oddball in the committee. I may articulate myself differently. This is something that we are charged with doing, preserving price stability and creating sustainable employment growth. You cannot have sustainable employment growth if you don't have price stability. Okay, I think here's what the, what the people are wondering about. Let's say the recovery happens a little bit quicker than people think, okay? Ojalá. You still got your ojalá. <laughs> and you still got this huge balance sheet. Right. Uh, and you've got, and let's say you've got unemployment still very high because it's going to lag. Okay, it, it is a lagging. Indicator. Okay, so how do you how do you plot your exit strategy? Are you able to start pulling back the liquidity, maybe even put in a rate increase while you've still got high unemployment? And that exit, even the G8 is calling on the IMF to help them formulate a, an exit strategy now. Wow. wow. Uh, I'll be interested to see how Congress reacts to having the IMF dictate an exit strategy, but that's another story. All I can tell you, Kathleen, we are constantly aware of this. We are constantly talking about it. We're constantly thinking through what do we do to exit what we've done. Now, some of the programs we created, as you know, have been accordion-like. Commercial paper facility, for example, has been shrinking because there is a commercial paper market now. And uh, the big bulges in the balance sheet come from the mortgage-backed securities and the small amount of treasuries that we committed to buy. And those are longer-lasting so that, that, that's really the issue. How do we withdraw whatever stimulus has come from that what? at the right time? But the so key is to do the it right at the right time. How do you know? Well, that's a matter of judgment. Okay. We have lots of history here. In 1937, the Fed drew back in and created a worse situation than it did before. So I know it's a trust me deal, but the fact is we have to apply judgment. There's no mathematical formula that tells us how to do this. This is a collective judgment of 17 people that sit at that committee, led by a very able chairman of Ben Bernanke. And, you know, it's a matter of confidence. Alan, you just mentioned earlier, may not have the confidence. I do. Okay. So uh, how about um, how about the, the bond purchases? Mm -hmm. Is it time to do more because rates have risen, mortgage, backs, you know, mortgage rates mm -hmm. have backed up? Or is it time to say, it's not working, the economy's turning, just, just forget about any more bond purchases. Well, well, first, the statement is not working. The reason that we went, underwent this program, agreed as a committee, was to improve the tone and conditions in the private credit markets. Now, if you look at a recent issue like Anadarko did last week, a B, triple B minus credit, enormous issue, very favorable rates. Rates have not only, not only have spreads come down, rates have come down in the high quality uh, private bond market, but also in some of the junk issues that have come forward or lesser rated issues. So I, I do think the program has had its impact. At the same time, you can't counter this enormous flood of new demand for money coming from the United States Treasury. So we haven't finished that program, and I'm not going to comment on the prospect of anything in the future. We're only halfway through both that and the mortgage-backed security program. Okay. Well, we have some more time with Richard Fisher, <laughs> thank goodness, because I want to uh, get into next with Richard about financial reform, financial regulation, some talk about curb powers for the Fed and Congress, all that and more coming up next. Let's get more with Kathleen Hayes and Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher. Kathleen. Okay, Carol, thanks so much. And, you know, we've been talking about the balance sheet and the exit strategy. Trust me, says the Fed. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. But Proof is in the pudding. It is. But, you know, something the Fed doesn't control, which is a very large concern to financial markets, and that's the big budget deficit. Mm -hmm. You were in China recently. You said you got asked 100 times about the Fed monetizing the debt. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you've got the big balance sheet, which maybe you can rein re in. You've got a deficit you can't rein in. Doesn't that also put a lot of pressure on the Fed? Mm -hmm. It does. We are charged with creating the monetary conditions for sustainable employment growth. That means price stability. You can't have sustainability without it. So, yes, it does put pressure on us, but we are independent, and we are independent within the government, and our job is to do what we've been charged to do. Does it create inflation pressures? In and of itself, does that big balance sheet and the budget deficit in some way create inflation pressures? Because quite apart from how the Fed reacts, I think that's another thing people are concerned about. It, uh, the issue is whether we monetize those deficits or not. Uh, Little guys like me have said we will not monetize deficits. The chairman was very clear in his last testimony, we won't monetize these deficits. And that's the issue, whether you create the money. It's always been a tendency of governments throughout time when they can't face up to what they need to do to meet their liabilities to have the central bank print their way out. Uh, I don't feel that pressure, by the way, coming from the Obama administration. I've sensed none of it. 
and uh, that's not what we're there for, and I don't believe we're going to do it. Okay, speaking of the Obama administration, the president on Wednesday is going to lay out his blueprint right. for the financial reform. And, you know, one of the things people are talking about is the Fed getting broader authority under this reform plan, of course, uh, especially over the too big to fail institutions that have really been the heart of the right. crisis. But critics say, you know, the Fed doesn't deserve any more authority because they didn't even see the crisis coming. How do mm. you come down on this? Well, you can go back and point your fingers at who's to blame. The question is, how do you go forward? I think the key thing is you have to have a system where risk can be identified. Clearly, all these systemic and other risks were not properly identified. So we have to figure out a system that gets that done. And then secondly, how do you, how do you deal with it? Those are the two main issues. Uh, Governor Torillo, one of our colleagues, gave a speech on this today. He gave a speech a couple of days ago. Uh, it's still being worked up, but I think that's the key thing to try to accomplish. And I, I don't think it makes sense to say somebody shouldn't be given this much authority or not given that much authority. What we want to prevent is from what happened recently from happening again. And I do think the Fed will have some expanded powers, but I'm not privy to the final details of this, so I really shouldn't comment any further. Well, but one thing I do want to ask you about, because you have commented on it broadly, right. and, and you know, you think of the, the Fed getting more power, or even just putting that to side, the role of the district banks. I'm You're, very outspoken on that. I know you are. You're concerned about being politicized, but one of the issues right. that's been raised is now that people are paying more attention to the Fed, what about a conflict of interest, they say? You've got boards of directors, mm -hmm. many of whom are bankers, mm -hmm. appointing mm -hmm. the Fed bank presidents, mm -hmm. Congress taking a look at that and saying, maybe we should get involved, too. You know, this system's been in place since 1913. It's waxed and waned, but the basic structure has been in place. It works. We're about to celebrate our 100th anniversary in a couple years. Uh, I think you'll find that the district banks are extremely well managed. And this federation that we have between, and the way it was set up, between centralized power in Washington, the people that speak for Main Street in the banks, works. I, I do think it would send a shiver up the spine of the markets if you were to politicize the Federal Reserve Banking System and make those present subject to congressional appointment or political control. It's a measure of confidence. The votes are split on the FOMC, as you know. All governors vote, and then there are five banks that rotate their votes with New York always getting a vote. I think it's very important to make sure and signal to markets it will not be politicized. Frankly, Kathleen, I don't think this is a major issue right now. I think this has been somewhat dissipated. But, you know, we have to earn the respect of the public. Congress makes the laws. We have to be worthy of the laws that they make. Speaking of Congress, uh, you know, Ben Bernanke has led the Fed in taking these extraordinary measures. Mm -hmm. Many people have applauded and they say without these kind of measures, we wouldn't even be talking here today. They'd be in such worse shape. Some people right. say, or, or question them, particularly in Congress. Are you concerned about Ben Bernanke's relationship with Congress after all this, and particularly when you hold, look, think of a second term for him? Well, the object should be just to do our job right, right now. I've talked to Chairman Bernanke quite a bit about this. There, you cannot doubt his sincerity. The question is, let's just do what's right. Let the chips fall where they may. You have to remember, he came in, in a sense, during an interregnum between an outgoing administration and an incoming administration. All the focus was on the Fed, plus the nature of our duties, given what happened in the system. It fell onto the Fed's shoulders to take the lead role in this circumstance. So you could quibble with some of the things we've done, I'm sure. You could question this 13-3 authority. But that's our job. We did it. Okay. I think, and I hope we did it well. Richard Fisher, well, you're doing this interview job very well. We're <laughs> going to continue with Richard Fisher in just a moment. More on the economy, inflation, and oil. Continuing our conversation with Richard Fisher, president of the Dallas Fed. And, Richard, there's several things I want to hit on now in our final time. So we'll make this a speed round. All right. Uh, starting with the jump in mortgage rates, which has been, if you look at Freddie Mac, you know, after you guys did a couple rounds of, of mortgage-backed security purchases and, and bond purchases down to, like, four and three quarters, yeah. 5.3, mm -hmm. last week 5.6. Is right. this a concern to you because mortgage rates ups maybe home, less home purchases, less recovery? Yeah, it is a bit of a concern, but at the same time, these are strong forces in the marketplace. We do have a whole bunch of resets that are going to take place. I'll tell you what helps me on that is that LIBOR has come down so dramatically. Most of these variable rate mortgages and the resets that are coming out heavy in 09, 10, and 11 are set to LIBOR. So I, I think the impact is somewhat mitigated by that very positive development. I want to ask you about oil. You know, you're the president of the Dallas Fed. You're a Texas man. Uh, uh, big gas producing <laughs> state. <laughs> there you, well, that too. But, you know, with, we, we're already at 70 bucks with no global growth. Right. When the economy, U.S., globally starts recovering, where's oil going? This is a tough one to figure out. You can't tell what is a fundamental demand supply situation versus speculation. The oilies that I talk to, and, of course, I talk to a lot in my district, feel that a lot of this is just sort of 
investment driven. There's a lot of inventory on the seas and elsewhere. And it's not clear that these prices are driven by an increase in economic momentum or whether or not they're just being driven by speculators. And I don't know the difference between the two. It's very hard to discern here. Okay, big picture. China, India, we know that they're coming on strong. Other, mm -hmm. what we used to call developing nations that are getting quite developed. Are we getting to some sort of pressure on resources that's unsustainable, some sort of tipping point? China's an enormous consumer of resources. If you look at the amount of cars, 50 million cars going to 100, no matter what they do, half of all oil goes into gasoline, so obviously that creates a little bit of pressure there. But uh, they cannot carry the world. It's still $8,000 per capita in income or even less than that. They need us to grow. They need our markets to be restored. They need consumption in the United States and in Europe. That's not happening right now. They're trying to shift domestically. It's going to take time. Enormous fiscal stimulus. Yeah, it's taken some bite. It's, it's working. But they can't carry the world on their shoulders. How concerned are you about the Chinese concern about right. us monetizing our deficit? Uh, they, you said you were peppered with questions I on that. I listened very carefully, reported back to my colleagues. I'm not the only one that has heard this. Uh, and uh, I do think, however, they realize that they want the dollar and the U.S. Treasury to do well. They depend on our success. We are interlinked by markets, by financial markets, by trade. So I don't see the Chinese doing anything that would damage the United States. It's in their interest. And in a way, they're in bed with us as investors and as savers. I have to ask you, because you are a voracious reader, anybody who listens to or reads your speeches comes away with lots of new ideas for books. What's on Richard Fisher's bed table right now? I'm going to disappoint you on this one. Dave Barry's 40th birthday. <laughs> he wrote it a couple of years ago. It's hilariously funny. And also his history of the United States. I urge you to read it. You'll laugh yourself silly. Okay. How's that for serious reading? Well, I'm glad to hear that you actually read something that isn't and actually, serious. I'll add the one thing. I just got a first edition of McKay's Extraordinary Popular Delusion than the Madness of Crowds, written in 1841. Anybody who wants to deal in markets, forget about all these new books that have just come out. Go back and read that. You'll see the fundamental errors that can be committed. Okay, quick final question. When Richard Fisher writes his book, what's it about? <laughs> I'm not going to write a book. I'm just going to read more when I write. Okay. Well, Richard, <laughs> thanks for joining us today in New York. I uh, we'll look Thank forward you, to uh, having this opportunity again soon. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. I appreciate it. it.